appreciate the hunger in God's people. I think oftentimes we have that hunger and we feel we're being deprived. But uh, it's a real blessing from God if you find it in your heart to hunger after the Lord. Because there are multitudes of Christians that really don't hunger after the Lord. And we're inclined to think a man is blessed if he could get up and prophesy great words of wisdom or heal the sick or perform a miracle. But Jesus never mentioned any of those when he uttered the Beatitudes. He did say, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they that hunger. Because as surely as you're hungering after God, God has that which you need and that which you desire and that for which you are hungering. He has it. He has it for everybody. He has it for the world. That's who are hungering for him. He has it for those who hunger. He has it for everybody. God had everything the church at Laodicea needed. We think of the church that was bankrupt, that was uh, wretched. God had everything they needed. And God's only complaint with them, as far as I could find, was that they didn't know it, didn't recognize it. They said, we are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. God had it all. But because they didn't know they needed God, they said, we're rich, and Jesus said, you're poor. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. But he said, I've got everything you need. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. The church is getting filled with counselors these days. I can't get over it. It's become another ministry in the church. They're hiring counselors now, along with pastors and assistant pastors. and They're hiring counselors. And the reason is because the people want an easier way out. And God has counsel. For I don't care what your need is. God has good counsel for you in his spirit. We don't want to really go to the place, come to the place of complete and total commitment, but maybe a counselor can dig up my past and tell me how I got it from my father or my grandfather or my great-grandfather. That's where your trouble is, you know. <laughs> I know our trouble's there, but it goes right back to Adam. It goes right back to Adam. God crucified it all at the cross. And before God ever made a man with a, an appetite like I think a lot of us have here I mean in the natural before ever made man with an appetite he made the fruits and the vegetables and everything else he needed to satisfy that appetite he made that on the third day on the sixth day he made a man and gave him an appetite for that which he had already provided and then told him, see those trees, those vegetables? I made that for you. That'll be your food. And so be assured, God has every provision for you. And that's why you're hungry. Because God has it there and he wants you to partake of it. He has it. He's already provided it. So blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. It is true, of course, that is, we eat, we still hunger. We eat again, and we still hunger. So the secret is in continually coming to Father's table. Amen. He that eateth of my flesh and drinketh of my blood. It must be an ongoing thing. And then we're never in a state of famishing. But I believe God is putting that hunger there in his people and recognize God is doing it. Recognize he's doing it. 
because there are many who are not hungry. So he's doing it. And we touched on it a little, how in the manna there was every provision for their need, but it didn't quench their appetite. Left them feeling, I'm not satisfied. I'm empty. It, I loathe this light bread. It's, it's not substantial, you know. It, it left them that way that they might know that man does not live by bread only. So that in eating of that manna that provided everything they needed, it didn't quench their hunger. God says, I fed you with manna and caused you to hunger that you might know that you don't live just by this, but you live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. We're going to find health in the body of Christ when we begin to depend on every word that comes from his mouth and not just on the food we eat. And I think we should seek to eat good food and all that. But we're coming to a time in this country and ours where the food's contaminated before we get it. It's contaminated while it's growing. Used to be, well, get back to nature, get back there, right, get the stuff right from the ground. Now it's coming from the ground contaminated, coming from the oceans contaminated. We've got to know God in this day and hour. Their life is not to depend on that food. It's poisoned already. We've got to eat of that hidden manna, which is well able to keep us healthy and strong and free from disease. And I believe that's God's purpose, that he, his people are healthy, physically, Spiritually. But I think he's putting the emphasis on the spiritual these days. He did send a great mighty wave of healing back in the 40s and 50s. He's, I know he's still healing. I'm not denying that. But there was a wave of it and people were being healed freely. And that seems to have subsided. And I think it's simply that God wants his people to recognize that it's the spiritual that God is concerned about. And for spirits, God brings about, brings to pass in his church that condition where life is flowing through the body, we'll find it in our physical bodies as well. And I believe the covenant of healing and of health is for God's people. Felt maybe for, I don't know, maybe a few sessions, speak a little bit about new beginnings because I think there's no question in our hearts and in multitudes of God's people that we do stand in the threshold of a new day and every new day is a new beginning I don't know how blind some people can get I hear it said if it's if it's new it's not true if it's true it's not new Nice little poem, isn't it? God's always doing new things. Every day you get up, there's a new day. A new day. There's times and seasons and years. God ordained it that way in the beginning in the natural and in the spiritual. There's times and there's seasons when there's a new day. This summer is not like last one, and that one is not like the one before. But while saying all that, we certainly recognize that there are certain principles which must remain constant for the simple reason that God is the author of the days and seasons, and God doesn't change. And so though he has many, many new things to bring forth to his people, and will continue to bring forth new things, Nevertheless, there is always the old uh, that we must cherish so that in the temple that Solomon built, God ordained that they would have storehouses where they would keep the spoils of battle 
that they had accumulated from the days of Israel's war, from the days of Samuel and on, there were many spoils in battle that God ordained should be preserved and put there in the temple. And so we never say because it's a new day that we don't need the past. We don't need the writings of the people of the past or the ministry of those of the past. And that uh, forget everything you've known because now it's a new day and, and there's new teaching. We're not saying that. There are many, many spoils that were won uh, by the people of God in times past for which they laid down their lives. And they're laid up there in God's house. They're laid up there. Some of them perhaps we don't have never seen, heard. That doesn't matter. According to God's plan and purpose, he has preserved a great heritage. He's brought us into a great heritage. And, uh, and so the psalmist would say, tell your children about this. And let their children tell another generation that that generation which should arise shall tell it to their children. The purpose being that God's people in succeeding generations would have had transmitted to them by their parents, by their fellowship in the house of God, would have had transmitted to them truths that they would need, truths that they would go by, truths that would keep them walking with God. So seek out the old paths, yes. We must cherish all the wonderful truths that have been restored. But in saying that, God forbid we should come to the place like generally the church has come to in any revival, as far as I know. Finally, God has done it. Now, we thought that we had it all when we were a Lutheran, but now we talk in tongues. Now we got it all, that thought. <laughs> and uh, because God still has many things that he has not yet revealed. I think the most of what God would reveal is still future. The most of his treasures are still future. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. A verse, I think, uh, in my generation, every young person could quote that. You learned it in Sunday school. And uh, when they would have what they called a scripture shower, someone was sure to quote that. I have not seen or ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And uh, we never looked up the context, never give another thought. Great day, someday we'll get to heaven and then we'll have all these things. And don't, uh, don't misunderstand me. God has tremendous things for the next life. Uh, he has uh, eternal riches. And don't be afraid that, well, you know, I, I think you're speaking something that really pertains to the next life. It's not for me. It's, uh, it's for the next life. Well, don't be afraid of that. Because uh, even if it is for the next life and God gives you a hunger and desire for it, you can begin to partake of it now. In fact, what you are partaking of, many of the things you're partaking of really pertains to another age. And Paul, writing to the Hebrews, reminds them that there are those who partook of the powers of the age to come but did not go on and turn back. If you've partaken of the powers of the age to come and then fall away, what we are really partaking of are the powers of the world to come. So then, don't be disturbed if I say something and you think, oh no, that's for the world to come. Well, God forbid that I should come up with a lot of uh, guesswork about those areas. I try not to do that. But if God, by his anointing, is bringing forth things that pertain to the world to come, well, um, he must want us to partake of it in measure. Because the ultimate of what we're really looking for is the resurrection from the dead. 
As far as I know, I considered an ultimate to rise in the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's going to happen someday. The trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised and the living shall be caught up with them to be with the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We anticipate that. The saints, I believe, of all ages, many of them anticipated it. Though in the Old Testament it wasn't real clear, but once in a while there'd come forth a clear pronouncement. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand in the latter days upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this flesh, yet in my flesh I shall see God. The living hope, and so when Jesus came back to at the request of Mary and Martha, for their brother was sick. Jesus waited till he died, till he came back, deliberately waited till he died. And of course, when he came back, they said, sorry, Lord, you should have been here a couple of days ago. Four days, I guess, wasn't it? If you'd have been here, he'd have got better. Jesus said, he'll rise again. Oh, yeah, we know. <laughs> <laughs> we know he'll rise in the resurrection. <laughs> He'll rise in the resurrection. We know that. But Jesus says, I am the resurrection. So true, that's great, that resurrection day. But Jesus says, I'm the resurrection. It's not just an event. It's him. It's a person. So I believe it's a new day. I really do. I believe it's the dawning of a new day. And let's not consider it's going to be the same as yesterday. Principles are the same. It'll be the same son of righteousness. But he rises with healing in his wings. Same Son, yes, the same Christ, the same living Christ coming forth in a new day. I felt greatly encouraged, helped, edified with what became known as the Latter Rain Revival. I believe it was a great move of God. And I know sometimes uh, a younger generation sort of, uh, mm, we've missed out on We've missed out on the good things of this century. And I used to think that concerning the uh, Pentecostal revival. I wasn't around when the Pentecostal revival had started. In its purity, it didn't take long to, to go the way of man. And I was close to it, and, um, and so I knew the power of it, and I, I knew the uh, the glory of it, just by hearsay. And you sort of feel, well, you know, I sort of missed it there. But I've come to recognize that uh, if we truly believe that the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day, uh, that uh, you don't miss out on anything. Because then there's hope for another day. There's hope for still another day. And so that hope keeps you expectant, keeps you in a state of anticipation and expectation. And that will be the preparation that you will need for any new day. Remember that? What are the preparations that we're going to need? We sometimes say we've got to be prepared for what God is going to do. That's something very individual, I believe, that as you walk with the Lord, be diligent. Perhaps the Lord will appear today. You see, perhaps he'll appear in our midst here, or where you are. Be expecting him, be anticipating a confrontation, a meeting, or a confrontation. And I believe it's bound to be both. <laughs> 
Though we anticipate his glory, it's a very awesome thing for his glory to be revealed. For then it reveals all areas of darkness within you, for he is light, brilliant, shining light. And you can't come into the presence of that brilliant, shining light and not have that light expose all areas of darkness. But isn't that what we want? And so we don't shrink from the light like the children of Israel did when Moses came down radiating the glory of God. We, we must not shrink from it. Come to it. You say, it'll slay me. That's right. <laughs> Let's come to the light. Remember that. Don't never run from the light. Come to the light. For God intends his light to sweep away all the darkness, to reveal all those areas of darkness that in revealing it he might sweep it away. That's the purpose of the light, not to destroy us, but to sweep away the darkness. But it will do one or the other. That's why in the coming of the day of the Lord, a lot of Christians can't understand when they read of the wrath and the judgment and the desolation. God, well, thank God he's going to take us out of here. Oh, no. Because the day of the Lord is God's day. It's not God's night. And I never saw that till a few months ago, maybe a year or two ago. You say, you never saw it? Well, have you? <laughs> The day, it's the day of the Lord. We're not looking for a dark day, a dark night that's coming. Paul says the darkness is passing away. The, the night is far spent. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore put on the armor of light. Because the day is at hand, put on, and did you ever notice that? That when the day of the Lord comes, instead of God taking us away, he clothes you with armor? Put on the armor of light, because you're not children of the night, you're children of the day. And that's how it was with the children of Israel. I said we're going to start, talk a little about new beginnings. Uh, if you want to open up there, I might not deal at length with it, but Exodus chapter 12. God said, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months that shall be the first month of the year to you. God said, This is to be a new day for you. To be a new day. God has many new days, and Lord willing, we want to go into some of God's new beginnings in the Scripture to give us confidence and hope, because it's not... See, truth is not really complicated. I think it seems that way because by nature we are very complicated and so many areas of darkness and... and uh, ignorance within us that it seems complicated to us but wisdom speaking in the book of Proverbs says all my ways are plain to him that hath understanding and, and so truth becomes very simple I believe as, as we let the Lord work it in our lives but as long as it's out there for you and I to struggle with and try to comprehend with our natural minds, of course it's complicated. But God intends it to be simple. Uh, he intends us to digest it, to partake of it that it might be food for us, eat it, drink it, let it become food for us. And then you don't worry about the theology of it. You sit down at a table and uh, if we sat at our tables like they sit around arguing about theology, 
you, you, you'd hesitate to drink that water because the scientists would say, do you know what that is? That's hydrogen and oxygen. They're both a, a gaseous thing. Oxygen, we breathe it. And uh, hydrogen is very inflammable. It'll burn. Should I drink that or not? I don't know. And then you grab the salt, you know, and you're going, oh, wait a minute. That's composed of sodium and chlorine. Chlorine is a very poisonous gas. <laughs> and uh, some soldiers in World War I were afflicted with it till the day of their death. And sodium. Well, I remember once in a laboratory at school, I think it was sodium he took out of some solution and it began to burn right there in the air. Is that right? I think it does. And that's all salt is. But somehow God had a way of putting it together so it was something that Jesus said was good. And so you know you can be so, you can be like a, a scientist. He, he dare not eat anything because he knows there's poison in that and that and, and this would consume you or, and this would, I don't know what all. But those who aren't scientifically minded, take it, the water and drink it, take the milk and drink it, take that vegetable and drink it. So the truth, if you dissect it too much, can become poisonous. <laughs> You know, you just take one doctrine there that you like, you know, and feed on that and it could poison you. But somehow, but you say that's contradictory to this other doctrine. Well, I know it seems that way, but not if the Spirit puts it together. As an example, I like the doctrine of election and predestination. I do. I really like it. But um, if you just hang on to that and don't accept your responsibility in the things of God, it can make you sick. It can make you high-minded. It can it. it. can cause you really to just die spiritually. But somehow God mingles it up with a doctrine that says, whosoever will, let him come unto me and drink. Whosoever will, let him come. And the Spirit and the Bride say, come. And whosoever heareth say, come. Come drink of the waters of life. A young man stood up in one of these Calvinist churches years ago, started to preach something like this. An elder came up and tapped him in the shoulder. My son, you're not preaching election. He says, if you'll go and put a cross on the backs of all the elect, I'll just preach to them. <laughs> but he didn't know who was elect. So he said, whosoever will may come. And the elect would come. For Jesus said, you have not chosen me but I have chosen you. And it's something you can rest on in times of trouble and difficulty and God chose me so if I'm a brand plucked out of the fire, God, all I can say is I thank you for it. <coughs> but if I study up in the doctrine of election and know it so thoroughly that I say I'm elect because it says here ye are elect, I'll have to say to you, it says it there in the book, but are you doing what the Apostle Peter said to make sure that you're one of the elect? He says, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, 
the godliness, brotherly kindness, the brotherly kindness love. For if these things are in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be idle nor unfruitful in any good work, but he that lacketh these things is blind and short-sighted, has forgotten he was purged from his old sins. Therefore, be diligent to make your calling and election sure. So you see, God speaks to the elect. Make your election sure. If you have faith, become steadfast in it. Know about God and his word. Add your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control. Come to the place where you keep your body under by the power of the Spirit, that you do not let the lust of the flesh destroy that life you have. Patience. Adding all these virtues, you see. That's the only way we can know if we're the elect. God knows, of course. And God says, The foundation of the Lord standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But you say, can you then reconcile the two doctrines? No. No, I can't reconcile the two doctrines. I've tried for years to do that. <laughs> and many others have tried for years. One man decided, well, I'll, I'll get this book. This man's got a book on, on Romans and, and Romans 8, predestination. I'm going to get that book. And he found one, an old writing, I guess it was. And he bought it and took it home so he could somehow, by the writing of this great theologian, he would be able to reconcile in his thinking uh, this doctrine of predestination with the rest of the Bible. And so he hurriedly gets home and opens up to Romans 8 and someone had torn the page out. <laughs> <laughs> someone else had the same thought. <laughs> but uh, God has purposes that will not miscarry. He's got purposes that will not miscarry. We rest in that. we got to rest in the sovereign God. You know, you can't figure it all out before you can rest in God and, and his truth. We'll never figure his truth out. It's intended to be food for our daily bread, water for our thirsty souls. That's what it's intended to be. Not to so understand it all that we can uh, argue with people about it and because you won't be able. I've discovered, and you can spare yourself a lot of that frustration in trying to reconcile aspects of truth. If uh, you can receive this, you won't be able to reconcile many aspects of truth. And God never intended that way. But in giving bread, he mingles them together in such a way that even though by itself that salt could kill you and that sodium could kill you and many of those ingredients could kill you by themselves, nevertheless coming forth from the heart of God and intermingled by the process of creation and life that is in God, he makes it to be health for our souls and spirits. living bread except you eat my flesh and drink my blood you have no life in you they couldn't couldn't make it make any sense in their thinking it, just, it sounded awful it sounded gruesome and and Jesus deliberately said that to people whom he knew would not receive it Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And he knew it, it would cause him to stumble. His own disciples were bothered with it. But he knew also that those whom the Father had given to him, though they couldn't understand it, would rejoice in the Spirit 
that came from the lips of Jesus and they knew it was right. Like someone said this morning at the breakfast table, he just knew it was right, but he couldn't understand it. Well, that's good. <laughs> and in process of time, God will give us a little more understanding in all these areas as we need it. As we need it. Not just as we ask him for it, but as we need it. So God does have new things, and I just started to say, I was greatly blessed, illuminated. I know God did something in my life that was different. Though it wasn't, I wouldn't say, a sudden thing, but I just recognized within a few months after the, uh, I'd partaken of the benefits of what became known as latter rain, which we never called it that, up our way, it got that name down here in the States some months or a year or two later because they did not believe the brethren whom God used to bring forth that move. They did not believe that was the ultimate latter rain. They believed it was just the foretaste of it. Nevertheless, it was a great blessing. It was showers of God's rain about his inheritance. And uh, I found great benefit from it was helped by it, but within about three years I realized I had to step out of it. Not out of the rain, I hope, but out of that particular structure that grew up around it. And it bothered me, and because I, I thought we were there in 1950 where I think we are now. <laughs> I don't know, but it does seem to me that we've come to end time. And I thought we were there then, and so it seems so devastating that God would have started this thing, and suddenly, two, three years, it just seemed to peter out. And I suppose I mourned over it a little. So one time, I think the Lord uh, quickened to me that passage. And Isaiah, I think it's 43, or in there. Remember ye not the former things, or consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and streams in the desert. God does new things. He's always been doing new things. I believe he always will be doing new things. I can't help but believe that in eternity he'll be doing new things because he's eternal. And in him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I can hardly imagine that after a few millennia that finally all God's riches of wisdom and knowledge have been exhausted. <laughs> Paul talks about declaring the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable. Nevertheless, the Spirit searches them out, and you and I search them out. And if the Spirit is searching, and we have the Spirit, we're listening to the Spirit, the searching in our heart is good. But if we're searching out those hidden treasures in God without the Spirit, It'll end us up in a lot of confusion. And that's why God gave us his spirit that he might search out the deeps in God while at the same time searching out our hearts. That as he finds a place in our hearts for this truth that he's searched out in God's heart, he can join them together. And so the deep in our hearts, that hunger, that desire, that longing, the Spirit knows it. He's found. Here is a searching heart. And so he searches out of God's heart, joins it to our spirit, that we might partake of it. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, combining spiritual 
truths with spiritual words, imparting spiritual realities to spiritual people, however we might take it. And some translators bring out both those thoughts, that the Spirit of God takes from God and finds that spiritual quality, entity in us, and he's able to join it so that there's a conception, there's a birth, there's a, a, a an importation of that which is in Christ into our hearts by his Spirit. And so God says, new things do I declare. The former things have happened. And new things do I declare. And in the other verse, remember not the former things. We thank him for the past and all that. But we do not, we cannot recall the past and he doesn't want us to linger around the past. Whether it be in areas of uh, beauty and success or, or areas of tragedy and desolation. Forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward to those things which are before. That's why Ephraim must take precedence over Manasseh. Uh, though they were sons of Joseph and though Manasseh was firstborn, uh, it was upon Ephraim that the blessing was pronounced. Because if God is going to bring forth fruitfulness in your life and mine, uh, he has to make the sign of the cross upon us, so that when Joseph brought Ephraim and Manasseh uh, to his father Jacob for the blessing, uh, he brought Manasseh in his left hand so that jo Jacob, all he had to do was reach out his hand and, 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 and take him by the hand, lay his hand on on uh, little Manasseh. Because, and so Joseph made it convenient for Jacob to pronounce the blessing on the right son because Manasseh was firstborn and that was very important in Israel that the firstborn would receive the preeminent blessing. And so he's making it easy for Jacob and Ephraim in his right hand. And But Jacob, he ignored it all and he, in his blindness, crossed his hands. Mm -hmm. Joseph said, Jacob said, Joseph said, no, not so, Father. Uh, th I, I brought him here in my left hand so y your right hand would touch him. I know it. I know all about it. But upon Ephraim shall be the blessing. God crossed his hands over you. Those things that you present to God that you want him to bless? Has he put the sign of the cross there yet? <laughs> Forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward to those things which are before. Oh, you say, that's easy. My past is, has been a desolation. Oh, uh, yeah, but you remember that still? Is it still a, a thorn? Is it still bitter in your mouth? Another says, well, I've had a very... Ephraim means fruitfulness, but more than fruitfulness, double fruitfulness. We talk about the double portion. We want the double blessing. That's for Ephraim. But God must cross his hands upon us to cause us to forget the past. Though the past was essential, it was first. It had to be there to make way for the future. To make way for that which God would do in the future. You had to go through those areas in the past to make way and to prepare for the work that God would do in the future. You say, I don't know that there's much preparation in my life. Well, if there's been disappointment, if there's been perplexity, if there's been trial, if there's been trouble, 
That's the preparation. If there's been unfruitfulness, if there's been barrenness, that's the preparation. Because I'm sure that what God will do in these days, in the days to come, He's going to do it through a weak people, a barren people, a people who have known devastation, a people who have known trouble, sorrow, disappointment, trial, whatever. That's why he says, Rejoice thou barren that beareth not. Break forth into singing thou that travailest not. For more are the children of the desolate than of her that hath a husband. And particularly in times when God would bring forth something special, does God use the barren and the helpless and the weak? That no flesh should go in his presence. When God would bring forth the promised seed, Sarah was barren. And the older she got, the more hopeless it became for God to fulfill the promise. When God would bring forth a Joseph, preceding that, Joseph, who is to be a great deliverer, not only for his own family, but for Egypt. His mother was barren. Rebecca was barren. Elizabeth was barren. And so when God promised them a son, he said, can't, Lord, now. Too late now. I say this to encourage young and old alike, because the older are inclined to think, well, you know, I've done my best. I've, I'm getting up there now, and time for the younger ones to take over. That's often the attitude. God is going to use some old men in this day and hour. He's going to use some young ones. And the young ones will have to learn these things that we're talking about. You say, well, I haven't got time. You mean to say I've got to wait 40 years like you did? I don't think we've got time for that. But infants went into the land of Canaan and grew up not having known the wars of Canaan and the turmoil that their fathers went through to come into that land. And so God left some enemies there to prove them in the land of Canaan. So if you get into the land of Canaan without too much warfare, <laughs> don't think you missed it all. Because <laughs> God will have some enemies there too. That you might learn war too. those who had not known the wars of Canaan. Behold, a new thing I will do. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? Israel had come to a place where God is going to do a new thing. And God revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush and told him, go back and deliver my people, which was his vision 40 years before, but not now. God might let God might bring things to pass in your life that you you feel well yeah I did have this vision but it's a thing of the past in order to clarify it to purify it to purge it to make it to be his vision because God was not able to use that strong and mighty prince in Egypt Moses son of Pharaoh to all appearances son of Pharaoh in his own in his own way of life son of Pharaoh designated by Pharaoh to do many great projects we're told in history he was, Pharaoh appointed him to go and build cities and, and uh, look after various things of the empire and he was in a key position to bring deliverance to the people right there, right at the top, politically speaking. And so, some are encouraged today to 
get in there. Become a senator, become a mayor maybe first, and then a senator maybe, and get into Congress, and first thing you know, you might be president, you'll have a Christian president, and right there in the key position. But it's not in the realm of politics that God is preparing deliverers. It's in broken, humble people of God out there in the desert looking after a few sheep perhaps that God is preparing world leaders. So now he was out of politics Pharaoh was mad at him. He was out in the wilderness feeding sheep. Give up the vision because I can't do it now. I'm getting older and older and I'm... Pharaoh's against me now. I dare not go back there. When God came on the scene, having found the vessel he wanted to deliver a whole nation. Finally got Moses right where he was. And God went looking for him. God went looking for him. Do you know that God's out looking for people? He's looking. Not with two eyes, but eyes within and without. His eyes are searching all over the earth, not for preachers or apostles or prophets or teachers or servants or slaves or they might become any of those things when God gets them. But the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout all the earth to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose hearts are right. His hearts are perfect toward him. That's encouraging when you consider that God's out looking for you. Yeah. If your heart's right. You don't have to step out there when you think God's coming by. Here I am, Lord. I'm waiting all these years now. Can you please use me? He's out looking for you, but he's looking for a, a, a heart that's right. Not looking for eloquence because Moses had lost his by that time. Not just looking for young people either because Moses was an old man there at that time. Not just looking for a, a guy that, you know, might uh, be politically minded and be able to pull wires with the officials. Because Moses had that once and lost it. Now they're up for his head. But all this is part of the preparation. <clears throat> and I think that little bush that was burning and not consumed was God clothing himself with Moses. And when Moses complained, I don't have any, I can't do it, I'm not eloquent anymore, I can't speak, God wouldn't take any excuse. I'm a little... Hmm. concerned or when any person is so fired up with getting into ministry so excited about it lest he be greatly disappointed or lest he hasn't known the dealings of God as Moses said I can't Lord I can't I can't I can't and God brought him to the place where Moses would know he couldn't do it. He brought him to that place where he would know he couldn't do it. Because that became the reason why God chose him. Because God must demonstrate In this new thing that God is going to do, he's going to demonstrate 
that is not in any individual in their education or their power or their eloquence or their abilities it's not in that but it's in the presence of God and therefore to be assured that God will have a people who will give him all the glory he doesn't choose too many of the other kind not too many mighty not too many noble not too many wise he does choose a few but the few he chooses their trials are greater because they've got to be that's all got to be wiped out or should I say consumed ashes mm. that out of the ashes of it all he might bring forth what he wants not many mighty not many noble not many wise are called you see your calling brethren but God has chosen the weak things of the world the things that are foolish the things that are not considered of any importance in the sight of man for Paul goes on to say yea he's chosen the things that are not to bring to naught the things that are how do you like it God says God says you're nothing how do you like that <laughs> that's what he's choosing so if you don't know it uh, and you feel the call of God just recognize that someday you will know it <laughs> I forget which writing it was but I sent it to this man and he uh, he said he just felt impressed just to read a chapter or so and then just as the Lord would indicate stop reading there I put a bookmark in so he put his bookmark in and uh, went to work the next day and complained all day to God how useless he was getting he says really Lord I think you brought me to zero and so he went home and that night and thought well, he'd read another paragraph and the next paragraph ended up by saying God is not in the process of taking us down a notch or two He's in the process of bringing us down to zero. <laughs> <laughs> and that encouraged him. <laughs> it encouraged him. <laughs> because he was telling God, God, that's where I am. And then he got confirmation. God says, that's what I want to bring you to. <laughs> That's what I want to bring you to. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak unto the congregation of Israel, and we won't read it all, but Passover time. There are going to be other new things. There are going to be the Feast of Pentecost. There are going to be the Feast of Tabernacles this is the beginning God doesn't always tell us you know there will be this and then there will be this and this and this one day enough at a time fresh man every day is sufficient to follow the cloud to the first stopping place in the wilderness is all we need to know right now we don't need to know how many stopping places there are going to be and he doesn't tell us he didn't tell them there were going to be 42 of them he doesn't tell us how many he just says follow the cloud that's all because the cloud of God God says goes before you to search out a resting place for you and he brings you to a place and it's dry and barren and bare and no growth no water no food maybe and you say, how could God have said that? That he's searching out a resting place for me. I think we sometimes criticize the children of Israel 
because of their murmuring and their complaining as if to say God if we were there we wouldn't do that (laughs) but we're very much like them and God led them that way this is a great mystery tremendous thing that God led them that way for your benefit and mine For these things were examples, Paul says, for us. So that he led them that way as examples for us. Not that we should do the things they did, but that we should learn the experiences that they failed to learn from. Learn from their mistakes. Paul starts out writing to the Corinthians by declaring what they were in Christ. And God always tells us that before he deals with us. You're my son. I've redeemed you. You're mine. I see you as holy in my sight. The saints at Corinth, the holy ones. I'm writing, he says, to the holy ones at Corinth. And so after he introduces his remarks, then he starts telling them how carnal they are. <laughs> and he says, you come behind in no gift as you wait for the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven, but you are enriched in him in all utterance and in all knowledge. And come behind in no gift. And they're feeling pretty good about it all. <laughs> Until and chapter 2, like we read the last day or two, how the Spirit has been given to search out those depths in God, join them unto us. Then the next chapter, I'm sorry, brethren, I can't talk to you to, as to spiritual people. I can't bring forth those deep hidden things of God and impart them to you because you're not spiritual, you're carnal. Paul was so led of the Spirit, you see, that he spoke, as he said, words which the Holy Ghost teaches, not which man's wisdom teaches. And so God led him to speak to the Corinthians the way he did. That's what they needed. Reaching forth from the heart of God, this is what they need. They need reproof, they need correction. They need to have a word that would cause them to realize their carnality and their foolishness and come to know you better. Writing to the Ephesian church, it is much different. He was able to reach out and bring out some of the hidden treasures of God's wisdom and knowledge that he could not impart to other congregations. So you see how hopeless we are as ministers? To minister living truth to God's people? If we're not under the anointing, Mm. if we're not ministering from his heart, because only he knows the hearts of people, only he knows what they need. And then he says to them, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that our fathers were all under the clouds, all passed through the sea. We're all baptized into Moses in the clouds and in the sea. Baptized in the cloud and baptized in the sea because as the waters opened up they marched on a dry path through the mighty waters on each side which the apostle likens unto baptism in the sea baptized in water going through the place of death yet coming forth in life on the other side but baptized in the cloud I wondered about that until one time I read in the Old Testament where the cloud which had led them out of Egypt and up to the Red Sea the cloud immersed the hosts 
move from the front to the back, immerse them in the cloud, stood behind them as a defense, led them in the right way and then stood behind them as a defense which is God's plan for his people as he leads us. The Lord shall go before you, it says, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rearward. You shall not go in haste, neither shall you go in flight. But the Lord will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rearward. The Lord leading, the glory of the Lord following. Not in haste, nor in flight. It was to the betrayer, it was to the betrayer that Jesus said, What thou doest, do quickly. To his disciples he said, You wait in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. The Lord doesn't push, he leads, he leads gently, he causes you to rest. In whatever work he gives us, God help us to find that rest. And we only find it, Jesus said, as we take his yoke upon us and learn from him. Then he said, you shall find rest unto your souls. For he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I would never want to tell anyone that Jesus had an easy life. Nor would you. But because the Lord Jesus had come to the place of such commitment that all he did was what the Father would do through him, all he would speak is what the Father would speak through him, that his very life was such that it, he depended totally upon the Heavenly Father, he could say, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He was just moving along in the realms of God. And therefore, in his concept, and I have to say that because I couldn't say that Jesus had an easy life, but that's how he looked upon it. Because no matter how great the task, no matter how great the trouble, no matter how great the persecution, how great the cross, He knew he was offering himself up as a sacrifice that was well pleasing unto God. A burnt offering from which God smelled a sweet savor. I know he cried in desperation, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he was also a sin offering and he didn't probably understand in his natural mind how God could have forsaken him as the sin offering God had to turn his back but as the burnt offering as one who committed a voluntary offering unto God of his voluntary will I will to do the Father's will God smelled a sweet savor of incense Paul says you had all uh, your fathers had all these glorious experiences of baptism Baptism in the water, in the sea, in the cloud. They all ate of that spiritual food that God gave them. That miraculous bread from heaven. They all drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Never was there a more blessed people than the children of Israel. I don't think there was any church more blessed than the Corinthian church. How be it, Paul says in the next line with many of them and the Greek is more emphatic with the many with the most of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness it isn't the case that God didn't love them and didn't bless them he wasn't pleased with them he just wasn't pleased with them uh, we have to know those things because we've come to a day and hour if God's blessing see God's right on our side not knowing Paul says 
You despise the riches of God's goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. God's goodness leads to repentance. That's why God is good. But how few there are who repent when God is good. God is confirming. And I've heard it said, and I fear it might be right, that because God was very, very merciful during the Iraqi war, very merciful, gave them a quick victory with hardly any bloodshed, it seems that the nation has suddenly become very proud. We know how to do it now. We were disappointed in Vietnam and all that, but we got it now. not knowing that the goodness of God was intended to lead to repentance. And I think God's judgments are brewing, becoming more and more imminent. That we who know our God must recognize in that day, we haven't got very far into the Passover, but that when God poured out his judgments, Upon Egypt, he left his people there. He didn't take them out. He left them there to be glorified in the redemption that he was working in their midst in the hour of Egypt's judgment. God says, I'm going to make a difference between Goshen and the rest of Egypt. I'm going to make a difference. And the word there, it's redemption. I'm going to put redemption between you and Egypt. Don't make a difference. Because you're my people. God doesn't fear to put us in the fire. He walks with us through the fire. He doesn't fear to pour out his judgments on the earth lest his people suffer. He's glorified and being the captain of our salvation in the midst of the struggle. And darkness penetrated all through the land of Egypt. It must have been more than a natural darkness. It is a spiritual darkness that God caused to settle down upon the land of Egypt. Was it three days? Anyway, a darkness so dense it said they could feel it in the land of Egypt, but not in Goshen. Why? Because it was God's day for them. It was a new day for them. It was a new day. This is to be to you the beginning of months. A new day in the darkness of Egypt. It was very, very dense, but the light in the homes of Israel was very, very bright. That's the way it's going to be in the day of the Lord, which is fast coming upon us. A day of darkness and of gloominess, I know. But Isaiah saw, and he perhaps didn't understand what he saw. When darkness covers the earth, and goes darkness the people, a light shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. When? When darkness covers the earth. When gross darkness covers the people. I was going to read this just in closing. One preacher said this is the first closing. <laughs> this will be the last. God's commentary on how he looked upon the children of Israel leading them through the wilderness. Psalm 95. Thou shalt go, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Goes on down. The Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. And praise unto God. That's what the Psalms were, songs of praise unto God. The sea is his and he made it. His hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship. 
praise turns into worship. Mm. Worship is of a higher dimension. Worship is something that we are to become. So is praise. It's not just something you do. Worship isn't just something you do. Jesus said the Father is work looking for true worshipers. So it's something you become, not something you do when you come to church only. It's something you become. So that if there's a great trial, you worship God. When God stripped Job, took everything away he had, went out and lay on the ash pile, bowed his face toward God, said, God, you gave and you took away, blessed be the name of the Lord, and says he worshiped God. The first mention of worship in the Bible, of the word, I know that Abel worshiped, Adam worship, but the first mention of the word is when Abraham said to his son Isaac, we're going up to the mountainside, and he said to his servant, you stay here, we're going up to the mountain to worship God, and we will return again. And you know what he went up there for. But that was an act of worship. Because whether it's test or trial, or victory and triumph, Abraham was a worshiper. God wants, God wants worshipers. But we're always worshiping God. So praise must progress into worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker for He is our God and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today if you will hear His voice we mention I think how suddenly they're going along in a certain realm and suddenly it seems entirely opposite. Worship, praise. Suddenly, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. As in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work forty years long, was I grieved with can you imagine that blessing them as no nation on the earth had ever been blessed before or since with the presence of God with a pillar of fire with a pillar of cloud with manna from heaven with water out of the rock with healing for the congregation and God says for 40 years I was grieved And said it is a people that do err in their heart and they have not known my ways unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. What a way to end a psalm of praise and worship. <laughs> they have not known my ways. His blessing, his gifts, his provision, yes. God, make us to know your ways. What uh, we've been dealing with in the uh, morning session. And perhaps, uh, Lord willing, in a way, uh, however he might plead to uh, carry on through most of next week. So, uh, I'll just read a portion from Joshua chapter 3. We've been talking about new beginnings. We started with the Passover. It was a new day, a new beginning. This day shall be unto you the beginning of months. Emphasizing how God has new beginnings. Over and over there are new beginnings and that the order is darkness and light, not light and darkness, darkness and light. The evening and the morning were the first day. And that just that one principle ought to fill God's people with great hope. If it's dark, God commands light out of darkness. That's where the light comes from. God commandeth the light to shine out of darkness. 
Israel had been in darkness 400 years. God commanded and light shone and God sent a deliverer. And they brought them out. They crossed the Red Sea. A new day for them. But before they could come into the purpose for which they came out, God must prove them, try them, test them, which he did through the wilderness. The first generation failed. God's testings. Blame God for their troubles instead of recognizing the evil of their unbelieving hearts. Nevertheless, God was faithful to forgive them. He brought them up to Kadesh. Told them now, now is the time to go in. They sent out spies, brought back the report of what they found in the land, admitting it was good, but we couldn't take it. Too difficult for us. And they made an excuse. We couldn't take our children into such a, a dangerous <coughs> land. And God took their excuse and made it to be judgment for them. And he says, I'm going to bring your children in. You're afraid that they can't come in? I'm going to bring them in. And you're going to stay here in the wilderness and die here. And God decreed that the, each day that they spent spying out the land would represent a year in the wilderness, so that for 40 years they were in the wilderness until the old generation was consumed. And so darkness settled on in upon them, but God shines out of darkness. And when the days of his judgment had been finished, God was bringing the new generation to a new day. Joshua, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan. So that which was the end of an old day for the generation that failed God was the beginning of a new day for the new generation. And that which was judgment for the old day on the old generation was preparation for a new generation. And out of the darkness that was coming over the old generation, God was beginning to shine forth in a new day to a new generation. The sun was setting for the old generation as the dawn was arising for a new generation. So that's, it's wonderful when we recognize that. But the sad part is that that for which we hope and long for and desire when we come to that point where God says, now is the time, the difficulty seemed to be so severe, the trial so severe, that if our hearts are not prepared, when we come to the very day and hour when God wants to bring his people into a new way, and the test comes, that's where so many fail, God. Hoping all along, God sent revival, we're seeking revival, we're praying for revival, God, we must have revival. And the time comes when God says, now this is the time. And we fail. Why not? Because we want revival, don't we? But we fail to understand that with every new day, we call it revival and all we think of is rain and blessing. But God doesn't just look on it that way. It might be a revival of a new day which brings sunshine and heat. And that's what bothered me when what they called rain in the beginning of the, in the middle of this century, what was rain, it didn't last so long. It just lasted a short time until, and it is devastating to many people to see how quickly that which we felt was a revival of the end time, the last revival, uh, it petered out. And, and then came the heat and the sunshine, the heat and barrenness. We don't understand those things because we don't understand God's desire in sending the rain is to water the plantings of the Lord that they might bring forth fruit. And somehow we're slow to comprehend that. Why should God want to send the barrenness and the drought and the heat? Because God's after fruit. That's what he's after. And so when he's blessing and there's a revival, we think, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful? All ready for the Lord to take us. But he wants the fruit. 
And like we said this morning, the seeds of what God will do and what God has in mind, the seeds of God's intention is right there in that movement of God, that new thing that God is doing. Right there in that new thing he's doing, he plants the seeds of his intention for the next thing he will do. And in early Pentecost, there were many who had a vision of a great harvest after the image of Jesus. Sister Amy Semple McPherson, founder of the Four Square Church, had a great vision of the end time that God, and I don't remember it all, because uh, sometimes since I read it, and I don't think you'll find it in any of her books today, because I'm told that this part isn't there. She says God's looking for fruit, perfect fruit. He's coming for the perfect fruit. That's what he's after. And he is. He's still after it. That's why he's waiting. The husband's waiting for something. He's waiting for perfect fruit. The husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it till it receives the early and the latter rain. He's still waiting. We know the time is nigh at hand. He's still waiting. So I know that the fruit is going to be perfect fruit. It's going to be better than any fruit he's found yet because he's still waiting. So you see, right in the seeds of the Pentecostal revival, God was imparting truth to prepare them for the next move of God. You say, well, there's no time for any more movements of God. Well, God's judge, not you and I. And they thought that in early Pentecost because the burden of the Spirit was the Lord is coming soon. That was the burden of early Pentecost. And that lingered on 30, 40 years. The people got weary of it and figured the Lord's delaying his coming, not realizing that the Lord comes in many different ways. That he comes in the rain. He comes in his refining fire. And I'm not saying there's two, three, four, five... Six different comings of the Lord. There's one coming, but in that one coming, there's the rising of the sun. In the dawn of the day, he comes to us as the dawning of a new day. And I know there are sudden aspects of it, and I know that the Bible speaks of that sudden translation of the saints, and we believe in that. But there's the shining forth of his presence before that. And so... We are very near to the coming of the Lord, and God's going to do a quick work in the earth. And he's not going to come just somebody, somebody, because somebody figures out in the scriptures that he's got to come on a certain day. You think people would learn, you know, you've all heard of that book. There's another one out. It's, of course, it's not 1988 this time, it's 1996. Well, it might be right. I'm not, surely someone will hit it right. <laughs> But the point is, you and I don't pay any attention to those calculations. All we got to say is, Lord Jesus, you're, you're coming for a people. You're coming for a people who are expecting you. You're coming to receive the precious fruit of the earth. You're coming to receive a glorious bride. So we know then, if we're part of that company, we know we will not be caught unawares. You say he comes as a thief in the night. I know not to those who are watching. For ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. So to those who are walking with him and walking in the light, they don't have to bother with all these books because they know the times. They know the times that the Lord spoke of. And Paul says, you're not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. The thief in the night is the way he will come to those who are not anticipating him. But to them that look for him, he shall appear. The second time without sin and the salvation. And we look for that. And we must continue to anticipate his appearing. But don't look for the second coming. Look for the Lord Jesus. I mean, the second coming is sort of a doctrine that's in the church and people are looking for the second coming. Instead of looking for him. Let's look for him. Anyway, they had come to this new day because... The older generation didn't hear God's voice when God spoke. For them, there was no tomorrow. 
But for the younger generation in their midst, there was a tomorrow. And as we hear God's voice today and obey him today and hear what he says today and seek to walk with him today, then there's a tomorrow for us. And I like to anticipate God's tomorrows. But the only way we're going to really appreciate and uh, and uh, partake of the blessings of God's tomorrows is when we are obedient to hear what he says today. And so the new generation had a tomorrow to look forward to. The older generation didn't. And so... Joshua chapter 3. Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it, after the ark, not after the priests like they do so often. They go after the man of God. Bring him to ruin, and they themselves are brought to ruin. Because God wants his people to go after him. And furthermore, I want to say, God wants a priestly ministry that will be so dedicated, so committed to God, that they'll bring into the midst of God's people such a fear of God that the people will long to go after God rather than after that vessel. And I don't know, we don't know who's really to blame, but somehow or other, it seems when God brings forth a great and mighty ministry, the people go after him rather than after the God whom he's supposed to be presenting. I think we have to blame both. The people for their lack of vision and discernment and understanding of what God wants, but the ministry for not emphasizing these truths. That God is a jealous God. And not only emphasizing it, but recognizing that as those who stand before the people with a word from God, they are under obligation to so seek God that they will have words from God's mouth by the Holy Spirit because only the Holy Spirit can glorify the Lord Jesus. And if a man is speaking out from his own heart, we're told, Jesus said, he's seeking his own glory. He that speaketh of, him, of himself, out from himself is what it means. He that speaketh out from himself is seeking his own glory. So therefore, what a tremendous responsibility is laid upon God's servants, all of us, that if we, if by the Spirit we're uh, prompted to give forth a word, it must be out from the Holy Spirit. For he it is who takes the things of Christ and makes them known unto us, he shall glorify me, for he shall not speak out from himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Speak what he hears. And we always recognize that. But somehow a few years ago, I came to suddenly realize that he inhabits this temple. And that when he speaks, he speaks out of your lips and mine. And I realize we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to fulfill the ministry that God gave him to fulfill. That he would not speak out from himself and he dwells within but that which he shall hear, that shall he speak. So it's his responsibility, but it's your responsibility and mine to be that temple of the Holy Spirit, to be in such union with him, to seek him somehow with the best we know that God, when we speak, let us speak words out of your heart. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit is not able to fulfill the function that God ordained him to fulfill when he came to abide in this temple. So what does he do? He withdraws. When he is grieved, he withdraws. And the holy presence of God withdraws and we carry on without him, not knowing the difference. So many times, God, where God moved mightily in a person's life, or in an assembly. 
You go back there five, ten years later, and you don't sense any presence of God, but the people don't seem to know the difference or they don't care. Because he's been driven out. You say, we want the Holy Spirit. I know God's people want the Holy Spirit for that great benefit he brings, for his gifts, for his blessings. But how many really want the Holy Spirit to come in and to be Lord in our gatherings together in his name? And we must come to that. In all of these things that we're saying, we're not ministering any condemnation to those who know that we lack the, in these areas. But that God might inspire our hearts to recognize that we lack. Because if we recognize that we fall short, then God is pleased. Because he will lead us. The sad thing is that when we don't recognize it, we feel we're doing all right. That's the lay of the sin spirit. Where we say have we are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and don't know. Thou knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. Don't know it. God has everything we need. God has tremendous things for the lay of the sin church. As much for this church as any other of the churches. But because they don't know it, won't accept the fact that they're in this need. They're not open for it. How can God give it? I counsel thee. And I, I don't know, I just stop here because there's, there's, the Laodicean church is getting so crammed full of counselors. I mean, it's another ministry now. You've got to hire a counselor, maybe two counselors to deal with the problems. And they get a lot of their their counsel from books of psychologists that don't even know the Lord. Or you say, no, I get it from Christian books. You check in some of those Christian books. And you'll find that that author got a lot of it from, from psychologists that don't even know the Lord. And so filling the church with counselors when God says, I counsel you. Buy of me gold tried in the fire that you might be rich. White raiment that you might clothe yourself. I shall to anoint your eyes that you might see. Good counsel. God help us to accept his counsel instead of running to all the other counselors, which in most cases can't help. And I'm not denying that there is a place for counsel in the church. But like my brother back there, Brother Mount, the Lord said he would have a ministry of counseling. And so he thought, well, I'll get these books and counseling. The prophet comes along just before you had time to buy the books, and he says, thou shalt counsel my people, but you won't get it out of books. <laughs> 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 counseling with the counsel of God. He's the counselor. Amen. And he's got it. He's, he's got good counsel. All we have to do is yield his spirit. He knows what you need. There's some counselor Let's see now, what about your father? What about your mother? What about your grandfather? Did they have these problems that you got? Yeah, oh, that's your problem, you know. Goodness, I know it's your problem. But go right back to Adam. We know it started there. <laughs> God crucified us at the cross. And we, God wants us to partake of the benefits of the cross. Not only for our justification but for the deliverance from the old life. And that's what this second crossing was all about. They were delivered by the redemptive lamb, but now there has to be a deliverance from themselves. And so he said, tomorrow the Lord, they had a tomorrow, because they were the younger generation that missed out on that other day. But because of God's oath, God said, I'm going to bring the younger generation in. I swear, he said, I'll, I'll bring them in. And he did. But God said something else when the old generation failed that I think is very significant. Moses, a true priest of the Lord, interceded for the people. And God says, I'll have to destroy them, Moses. And Moses, as a true priest, interceded. He said, Lord, how can you do that? Don't you know what will happen? 
when the Egyptians hear that you destroyed your people, that you brought out of Egypt, what kind of a name you're going to get? And they, they will say, oh, Israel's God, yeah, he brought them out, but he couldn't look after them in the wilderness, so he destroyed them. And Moses said, God said to Moses, all right, I will pardon according to thy word. But because God was more than gracious to that generation whom he was pardoning, more than gracious, there's something in his heart that caused him to say, I'm going to pardon them, but as I live, saith the Lord, the whole earth will be filled with my glory. As if to say, if you failed and, and, and I'm going to forgive you, I'm a just God. If I'm going to forgive you and keep this nation alive and do great things through them, I swear, he said, by myself. I'm going to fill the whole earth with my glory. So here we are today, and all over the world, the nations, the Gentiles. You say, well, I think I'm an Israelite, the tribe of Abraham. Well, I won't go into that. <laughs> Except to say, those that are in Christ are Abraham's seed. And those who knew that they were of the lineage of Abraham, Jesus says, you're of your father, the devil. So we won't go any further than that. <laughs> All over the world, there are Gentile nations that are receiving and partaking of the gospel of Christ. And, it, and you can look back and see the reason for it. The people whom he chosen to be his own special people failed God, and God says, my purposes will not fail. I'm going to fill the whole earth with my glory. Reminding us that human failure never does abrogate God's promises. But those to whom the word comes and they fail, it doesn't change God's promise. And Israel got into that trap that we're God's people. To us has been given the glory of God and the covenants and the law the service of God and the promises it's been given to us. We can't fail. So God had to send a, a prophet, John the Baptist, to prepare their hearts because they were just sitting there like the church is today. We're God's people. Don't get excited. He's coming, I know, but we'll go. And we'll go with him. Instead of realizing that it's an awesome thing to stand in the presence of the mighty God who is coming, He's coming to his church. And somehow, it's, it's never thought to be an awesome thing. It just we have the best of God's good gifts down here, and then someday he'll come and take us up there where it's even better. Instead of realizing that he comes to purge and cleanse his temple, to purge out all the evil, all the dross, he says to the church at Pergamos, I'm going to come with the sword of my mouth. You see, it's not really the coming of the Lord. When he comes into the church with a sword, a sharp sword to deal with the iniquity in the church, you won't say then it's not really Jesus. He comes. He comes to his church. I know he comes in clouds and translates it, but he comes to his church. He comes in refiner's fire. He comes to purge out the doctrines of Balaam comes to cleanse unto himself a holy people. How many comings? One coming, but he comes in all these different aspects. And so they came to an, a new day and to a new crossing, as it were another baptism, just as they were figuratively baptized in the Red Sea. No, it's so now, as it were another baptism through the Jordan. Not really another but uh, another aspect of the real baptism. Paul says there's one baptism. You say, what is it? Baptism of the Holy Spirit? Baptism of water? Baptism in death that Jesus spoke about? I have a baptism to be baptized with. Three baptisms? One baptism because each one is just a, a different aspect of that one baptism. And so people get all 
mixed up on this matter of water baptism. Some say if you're not baptized in water, you're not really saved. And others say, well, it's not really, it doesn't really have any real significance. It's, it's just a figure. But it's one baptism. And I simply illustrate it this way. You go to get married, you stand before the preacher, and he performs the ceremony, will you, will you take this one, and will you take this one, and I do. And so, well, you're married then, aren't you? Well, yes, you're married. But uh, then he takes you in the room and you sign. You sign for it. You put your signature down. The preacher came to me with that paper. I said, listen, I... It's fine print there. I want to go home and read that. He, he says, you sign right there. And I did. <laughs> well, it wasn't, it wasn't that I was married twice that day. And so then we lived together. Let's see. Happily ever since? Yeah. <laughs> and that's the real marriage. But there wasn't three married. And so baptism speaks of that union with Jesus. The real baptism is when you begin to walk with Jesus. That's the real baptism. It should happen at the same time, or maybe a few minutes after, whatever. And so, this crossing over, though it was not spoken of as a baptism, when they got on the other side, there was to be a circumcision of the whole nation. Because the former generation had been circumcised, but now they were dead, and the younger generation hadn't. God says, there's got to be now a new circumcision. And that's really what baptism is. Circumcised with the circumcision of Christ. But the circumcision not made with hands. But buried with him in baptism unto death. That we might rise to walk with him in newness of life. And so baptism, you see, is that cutting off of the old life. Cut off from Egypt, yes, but there's an extension of it. Not another baptism, but bringing about the reality of that which we had in measure, that which we testified to in faith and obedience. But just as it was with the children of Israel, God had taken them out of Egypt. But in this new circumcision, God would take Egypt out of them. Because the shame of Egypt, the reproach of Egypt, all that that pertained to the Egyptian life in which they had lived clung to them. Even though they came out of Egypt, somehow it clung to them. You know what I'm talking about. We come to know Christ and we're hoping from now, from now on, it's nothing but total obedience, total walking with the Lord. Total purity, total righteousness, and we always get disappointed. What was wrong? Oh, someone says, you didn't understand what happened when you were baptized. You were buried with Christ. And, oh, no, I didn't understand that. So then, well, we'll baptize you again. And so someone will go through a second baptism and a third baptism. You know, like uh, the man and wife say, you know, we didn't really understand when we got married what this was all about. Well, you say we're going to get married again. Maybe that'll help things along. No, it isn't that. You made the commitment, maybe in your ignorance, but God holds you to it. Maybe in our ignorance, but nevertheless, knowing the call of God, we said, yes, Lord, I'll follow you all the way. He holds us to it. He holds it, us to it. Not with an iron hand, but because of his love and mercy and grace, lifts us up when we fall, causes us to know that he does love us, he understands our weakness, he understands our frailty, he woos us along, to bring us to that day and hour when somehow, by the operation of his Spirit within us, that which we bore witness to, which God bore witness to, as we were baptized in water, signifying our identification with him, somehow it becomes more and more and more real. And we discover that the only way we really come to that overcoming life is by coming to such commitment to him that we truly bear about within us the dying of the Lord Jesus, which we can't do in our own 
fleshly efforts. But he tells us that as we obey him, we'll be able to do it. Because in obedience to the Lord, he leads us through our wilderness. And through circumstances, through situations, he leads us to take out of our lives all that old life of Egypt. He leads us to Mara. He leads us to Sinai, where he reveals himself as a God of great holiness, reveals to us the sacrifices, shows us how that in those sacrifices, when we bring that sacrifice unto Christ, he sees his sufferings. And as we begin to identify it with it, then that which took place in Jesus when he was nailed to the cross takes place in us. We don't like it. We blame God, murmur for what he's doing. But didn't you marry him? Didn't you say you want to be joined unto him? Then Paul says, if you're joined unto him, you're buried with him in baptism, into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also are to walk in newness of life. And so I, I don't feel that that relationship that we've had with him has really come to fullness yet. I know that. But I don't go and get baptized again thinking that that will help. I want to draw closer to him. I want to ask him, Lord, continue to remind me of, of what baptism means. Continue to remind me that it meant the cutting off of the old life. And this took place in a corporate manner up there in Gilgal after they'd gone over and uh, camped on the other side and you know the story how they took how the priests uh, stayed there in the bottom of the dry bed of the Jordan while the people of God went over Paul says I think God has appointed us unto death that you Corinthians you've come to reign as kings but we are appointed unto death and our appointment is unto death. You said that when you said, I'll take you in baptism. But you say, I didn't really recognize the implications of it. But God did. And he drew you and you accepted him. And you said in your baptism that I'm being cut off from the old life. And as you walk with him, you ask the Lord to make that commitment that you made to be actual in your life. And God will be faithful to hear, but he'll lead you in ways that you don't like in order that this work of the cross might become actual within us. Knowing that if we're faithful in that, then out of that working of the cross in our lives will come forth his life. So it's not that he leaves us there in the bottom of the Jordan. He leaves the old life there. And so twelve stones were erected in the bottom of the Jordan representing the whole nation. They were left there, and then they took twelve other stones and carried them on the other side. And there they erected them in Gilgal, which means rolling away. Because it was at Gilgal that God says, I'm going to roll away the reproach of Egypt. And I'm, I, I believe in my heart that there's going to be a corporate people. Who is a corporate people? God will bring them into a, a rolling away of the old life. Because I don't feel it's all gone myself, experientially. I know we thank him for all that has gone, but we still feel, do we not, certain areas of the old life. We get under condemnation over it, which God doesn't want us to do. For there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Paul says it has made us free. And so I don't try to kid myself like I used to. Well, Paul says I'm free, so I'm free. And Paul says I'm free, so I'm free when I know I'm not free. But it is true. It, from God's standpoint, we are free. But I've come to recognize when I read scriptures and I say I don't measure up to that, I've come to embrace that as a promise rather than to try and figure it out and say, yeah, I'm free. Uh, it's not just the freedom that you know, that some speak of totally free from the law of sin and death. It can't be that. So we water it down to fit in with our experience. Like in the old holiness movement where God used to use move mightily in cleansing waves of his fire and spirit. It's very real. But in process of time, 
that experience became less and less obvious in their lives and the lives of others. So they began to major a lot on sins and mistakes, you know. You, you sin, well, no, I, that was just a mistake because my sins, I was sanctified 20 years ago, so I don't have sin anymore. Well, I'd sooner say, Lord, I know I've, I've recognized sin there, and you said I'm free from it. I, all I can say, Lord, I, I'm falling short of what you provided. I'm falling short of your promise. Lead us, Lord, in a way that I might experience the full measure of what you promised. Instead of kidding ourselves that we got it, so we got to explain somehow of why we haven't got it. And still insist we got it. I guess I got you confused there a little. <laughs> God means what he said. The old life was crucified at the cross. And as God leads us to the place where he enables us to bear that cross as he intended. For there is a cross for us every day. We know that. Jesus bore a cross every day. But because he was faithful every day, the time came when the fulfillment of all the crosses he carried in his life was fulfilled ultimately in the cross in which he died and where we died with him. So that there was an ultimate fulfillment of it in that cross where Paul says, my sins were crucified so that there's no longer any condemnation and the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the old law. The laws of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the old law of sin and death. And when the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. When people insist, no, we've got to have the working of the law of sin and death in us as long as we live, just because it's a theological concept, and because they insist that nobody can come to that kind of cleanliness and perfection, they're saying to you and I, that God intends that the law of sin and death will always have more power in this life than the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Which is the most powerful? Which do you think is the most powerful? The law of sin and death that we got from Adam or the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? Which do you think is the most powerful? So when we look at it that way, if we're saying that the law of sin and death is more powerful, we're saying that the power to sin, the propensity to sin, the ability to sin, the drive towards sin, which we got from Adam, is the greater than the propensity to righteousness, the new life that leads to righteousness, the power of the Spirit, that comes from God's Holy Spirit and from Jesus. We're saying that that old law is stronger than this new and higher law. So take it a little further. We're saying that Adam's sin, which was, you know, partaking of the forbidden fruit, that there's more power in our lives because of Adam's sin than there is power in our lives because of Jesus' work on the cross. For if by the disobedience of one we were made sinners, so by the obedience of the one we were made righteous. It's just simply Adam's disobedience that made him a sinner. Because of that, you and I have inherited all that sin the last 6,000 years or whatever because of Adam's disobedience. Yeah, but how did I get it? I was just born in Adam. That's all. Though you look at that little babe and see an innocent little child, nevertheless, the seeds of sin are there. Because he got it from Adam. And are you going to say that that transmission of the sin of Adam to us has greater power and authority and must always have greater power and authority in our lives than the seed of life that came through Jesus because of his obedience. As Adam's disobedience brought this 
devastation of sin in the world, so by the obedience of one shall the many be made righteous. Read Romans 5 carefully, prayerfully. And it staggers you that as it was at Adam, so in Christ, only entirely the opposite. As in Adam we die, in Christ we live. As we inherit his sin, so we inherit Christ's righteousness. As we're born in Adam, so that sin is transmitted. As we're born in Christ, so that life of Christ is transmitted. And so Gilgal speaks of the cutting off of the old life. Delivered out from Egypt by the crossing of the Red Sea. But in the crossing of the Jordan, the cutting off of the old life of Egypt, the reproach of Egypt. That, that reproach that they carried all through the wilderness is always there. That shame of Egypt. They carried it. Whenever there's any trouble, they blame God and say, let's go back to Egypt. Still that desire to try and find some satisfaction in the old life. They didn't like this manna. It's better back in Egypt. Because God gave them this precious food and because it didn't look good. And it was... It wasn't substantial enough. It wasn't like the leeks and the onions and the garlic and the fish. It wasn't something substantial. It was, we're told, a light food. They didn't want it. And yet there was everything in that light food that they needed to keep them healthy and strong. Several million of them kept healthy and strong just by eating of that heavenly manna. Pestilences would come in times of disobedience and God would heal them. But he looked after them with that heavenly food. Something that we haven't experienced in the church. But it's there. It's a covenant for God's people. It's, it's, a, it's in the covenant. Healing, health for his people. We have to, we have to walk in obedience for him, unto him until, but God wants a, a ministry that will so minister Christ that they'll come under his lordship. Let us beware. Anyone who has a word of counsel or a, or as a pastor or teacher of the flock or prophet, let us always remember that we are there to minister Christ. That we're never to be a mediator. There's one mediator. And over and over again, in this generation, people have taken the place of a mediator. Whether knowingly or otherwise, people wouldn't do anything that God told them to do unless it went first through this prophet or this apostle or this pastor. It went through them he okayed it. Fine. What do you got? Two mediators. And so the purpose of ministry as to so reveal Christ, so impart Christ, so minister Christ, that they come into a one-to-one -one basis. One-to-one -one relationship with the one mediator. And so that doesn't absolve the ministry of responsibility. It increases their responsibility. You've got to know the voice of God. You've got to come to know what Jesus says. I might have a word from the Lord that would turn him and all that, but let it be a word from the Lord. Then it will be good counsel. Then it will be Urim and Thummim. And God is restoring Urim and Thummim into the midst of his people. I know he's going to do it. In the midst of all the confusing voices in the church, and God's people don't know which, where is that clear word. God is going to bring forth a clear word in Urim and Thummim. Which simply means, they're Hebrew words that were never translated. Simply mean the lights and the perfections. Something that Israel had. Something that was in the breastplate of the priesthood. You say, what was it? I don't know. Nobody, nor, does, nor does anybody else. God didn't tell us what it was. But something there, Urim and Thummim, that was so effective that standing before God 
And the priest had a problem, or he, he had, had to bring forth a word to the people who were waiting for him to come out of the holiest of all. Uh, there was some need that they had. And yeah, I know they had the scriptures. They had some of them. They had the law of the Lord written down, but this was not intended to take the place of the word, nor is Urim and Thummim. But you know very well that there are, in every day of our life, there may be things that come up for which we can't get the answer by thumbing through the Bible. We might get some guidance there, but you need some specific answers that the Bible was not intended to give us. Nevertheless, it does tell us if you'll bind his word about your heart and tie them about the, your neck, that that will be an imparted wisdom to you so that when you go, it will lead you. When you sleep, it will keep you. And when you awake, it will talk with you. So that's, I think, a picture of this Urim and Thummim. It was in the breastplate that was tied upon the shoulders. Tie them about thy neck. And God is going to impart that hidden wisdom in the hearts of his people who go on with him. So that not necessarily, it's not saying that you will always have the answer. But God will have the answer that he wants you to have. It's not to say that it will always be easy, but somewhere in the body of Christ, somewhere in that fellowship, there will be the answer that that fellowship needs. It might not be in every one, but it will be there somewhere in this corporate body that there's a time when we have to know the direction. We have to know God's will in this matter. And with that Urim and Thummim abiding in his people, whether it's in a prophet or one of the, someone that is not recognized even as a prophet, but someone says, I'm assured God is saying this and there'll be a confirmation of it. And that Urim and Thummim will be just as clear and just as certain as was the Urim and Thummim that was in the breastplate of the high priest. And that didn't last long in Israel. It wasn't there too long. Time comes your heart, you don't hear of it anymore. And I'm told that's why the builders of the second temple were so disappointed. Because they did the best they could and got the temple erected and had the priesthood functioning and all that. But where's Urim and Thummim? Not recognizing. It was there in Zechariah. It was there in Haggai. It was there. But God was beginning to put it in the hearts of men. And they had as clear a word from the Lord as Aaron ever got from Urim and Thummim. God was beginning to put it into the hearts of men. Even in the days of the prophets, God was beginning to bring about the new covenant. For no longer would they have to minister in the old ways with an old temple or an old sanctuary. But God was speaking about a new day and a new sanctuary. And though he authorized the rebuilding of that one in Zechariah's time, and God encouraged them in the building of it, he held in his heart, he reserved in his heart, and only showed them in measure what he wanted them to know and left them discouraged because God said the glory of this latter house is going to be greater than the former and they, they couldn't see it, didn't look like it. They did their best. Urim and Thummim wasn't there. The glory of God wasn't in the Shekinah. And yet God said it's going to be greater but they didn't know and the prophets didn't know and they, they searched, it says. The prophets, they used to search and inquire after God. God, what am I talking about? Doesn't seem to be here. Doesn't seem to be now. What am I talking about? And to them it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister these things which are now reported unto you by the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things even the angels desire to look into. So God was beginning, even back there, to reveal things. Nevertheless, a lot of it was hidden concerning that great day when Jesus would come offer up the perfect sacrifice, ascend to the throne of glory, send forth his spirit to abide in his people, to prepare in the earth a temple not made with hands, in which would be the full abiding glory, the same glory that led the children of Israel out of Egypt, that same glory would be in that temple. The same Urim and Summon would be there. The glory of God would be there, far outshining anything that Israel ever had. And so it is a new day for Israel to cross over the Jordan and become God's people.
cut off from Egypt, cut off from the reproach of Egypt, now ready for war. Don't be too quick to think that, you know, we're <coughs> soldiers in God's army, we want to be. But let not him that girdeth on his armor boasteth he that putteth it off. Because there's going to be some very strenuous warfare in order to come into this life. But we've got to know, we've got to be assured that we cannot wrestle against flesh and blood with fleshly weapons. We're wrestling against principalities, and powers, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And God has provided everything we need for that. Everything we need for that. And our weapons are not like the carnal weapons. Spiritual weapons. Helmet of salvation. And I'm assured God's got a helmet, a priestly helmet for his people. But that mind that gives you so much problem is going to be overwhelmed with the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. We're going to have the mind of Christ. Paul never said, I've got the mind of Christ. He said, we have the mind of Christ. So we look forward for that building of this body. And I know we get tired of waiting and so we say, well, the Bible says here, you know, what he wants, so let's do it. And I know that. But Paul says we're builders together with God. He's the architect, he's the builder. Jesus says, I will build my church, like one minister said. People read that scripture where Jesus said, I will build my church so we roll up our sleeves and go to work. Jesus is going to build his church. And you and I are not going to have too much to do with it. Except that somehow he enables us to get under his yoke and, and move along with him and his yoke. So we feel we're maybe carrying a big load sometimes. Maybe it's because we're trying to carry his part of the load. For Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so this new people redeemed from Egypt and purified through the wilderness experiences and baptized with this mighty baptism of circumcision, which meant to them a crippling, a total crippling of the armies. But because they were walking in obedience to God, the fear of God came upon the inhabitants of Jericho and they locked the gates because of this feeble, crippled army in their midst. God put the fear of God upon them. And that becomes our victory. Remember that. We can't go against the enemy and try and terrify them. But any kind of antics that we go through, antics or whatever the word is, can't terrify them with any kind of loud music or rock and roll or drama or presenting puppet shows and that stuff. You're not going to scare the devil one bit. But when they see a people coming along, helmet of salvation, they won't see it, but the host of evil will see it. With the breastplate of righteousness, with the shield of faith, the people girded with truth, with shoes on their feet, shoes not of the gospel, but shoes of the preparation of the gospel because these people have been prepared of God. When they see that kind of a people, it doesn't look too impressive perhaps, but they're impregnable. They're impregnable, but he's given them also a weapon whereby they can be not only impregnable as a fortress, but offensive as the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's the only offensive weapon you need. But it's got to be that Word that cometh out of your mouth. This Word here, but built within us, so that when we speak, the word that's here comes forth by the Holy Spirit out of the mouth. To slay and to kill any destructive thing that comes against us. By the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. 
And so, yes, it's nice to come here to learn the word, to read it, to understand it. But until it becomes, not only in our minds, and in our understanding, until it becomes established and built within us, you cannot send it forth out of your mouth. So God is preparing that kind of a people. Isaiah said, God has made my mouth as a sharp sword. In his hand he hid me. Hidden in God's hand. But when the day God decides to use that sword, you can't do it. Because you're in his hand. You're helpless. God takes it and sends it forth. And it does what God wanted it to do. So let God continue to build his word within you and to keep you in his hand. Keep you. How long? Just as he sees fit. For only the sword that the Lord sends forth out of your mouth is going to do the work that God wants to do. May God bless this word, each one of you.